Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, today's workshop is Think Like a Thing and it's taught by Professor Jonathan Gatto. Uh, before we begin, we're going to show you a short video and then the workshop will begin. No great thing, no beautiful invention happened just like that. It happens when we leave our comfort zone and embrace change, creativity, and out of the ordinary. We live in interesting times. We live in a world that's constantly asking questions, that's constantly changing. In a world where blockchain and robots will be the norm, where 85% of tomorrow's jobs don't exist yet. Where being multi-skilled is not just celebrated, but essential. At Dubai Institute of Design and Innovation, we believe that we need to prepare you for the future. To teach you skills that will power your tomorrow. Today, design matters more than ever. But how can design help, you may ask? We combine disciplines so you become well-rounded. From product design, multimedia design, fashion design, strategic design management, it's where you will learn how to merge different design disciplines. Presenting a four-year Bachelor of Design degree in collaboration with MIT and Parsons New School of Design, DIDI, not just another design university. All right, Jonathan, it's all yours. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm, um, I'm happy to have you all here today for this workshop. And um, my name is Jonathan. I'm a professor of uh, product design at uh, the IDI. And uh, today I will guide you through, um, I will give you a bit of a taste of um, how we think um, and in part what we do uh, as designers, as product designers. Uh, um, and uh, the, um, the way I structure the workshop today is um, divided in two parts. The first part where um, I give you a short uh, talk, a bit of a lecture I would say, but uh, it will be short, no worries. And um, we will talk about certain uh, aspects of, of product design again, but also um, as a way of thinking about, uh, about product design. And uh, a second part where uh, I will uh, ask you to do an, an exercise, uh, um, a small workshop where, um, a practical workshop where you'll have the option, the possibility to um, practice with um, uh, some of the things that we see in, this, uh, in, the, in the upcoming slides. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. And um, we try to make this interactive sometimes. So um, I will ask you uh, here and there to intervene if you want. Uh, um, so the workshop of today is titled uh, uh, Think Like a Thing. And today we, we talk about, uh, um, sorry, I think that's a second. Uh, do you see my screen? No, wait, maybe like this. Okay. Do you see my screen now? Yes, you can see it. Okay, brilliant. So I was saying today we talk about um, um, objects um, as part of, uh, of a communication system and uh, and and mediators of emotions. Uh, the question is what, what is an emotion and, uh, and what does this has to do with design, first of all? Uh, not least, uh, also like how, well, can objects convey emotions, mediate emotions? Uh, and we will look through um, this today, mainly using two uh, concepts, uh, two topics, uh, the one of color and the one of shape. Uh, uh, and those are two 
very important factors in, uh, in design products. Uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see why. So let me ask you a question first. Uh, do, you, do, you all, do you have a favorite color? Do any of you have a favorite color? Yes, sir. Yes? What, yes, what, what is that? So my favorite color is uh, purple. Purple. And why is that, if I can ask? Uh, is there a reason or is it more like a kind of, a, let's say, um, distinctive? Uh, yeah, actually purple stands for peace uh, and it's really uh, like it shows me a kind attitude if i'm thinking in that way uh-huh yeah so that's why i go for purple because red it has an aggressive attitude when that's how i think so okay, yeah. okay. yeah interesting yes yeah, sir thank you very much anybody else yeah so there are some answers in the chat okay like okay i can't read it because they have the presentation on the screen can 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 somebody read that uh, can you read that, Razan? Sure. So there's red, yellow, black, black, purple. Someone says, isn't it subjective? Brilliant. <laughs> that's, that's actually the kind of answer I, I wanted to hear. I'm, I'm asking this because asking what's your favorite color is not, you know, an obvious question. Um, it, okay, it assumes that uh, uh, whoever answered this question uh, is... Uh, uh, what we call a consumer, uh, meaning somebody that lives uh, in, uh, in the post-industrial age of consumerism. But also, um, it means also that uh, the person, that very person lives in an age where things like dyes were already sort of invented. Uh, um, colors are uh, very strongly linked with uh, the historical and, and especially the cultural moment in which we all live. Uh, and never, never as today, uh, with, um, with the advent of, uh, of the society of, of images, uh, color has, um, has taken such a powerful uh, um, connotation. Um, color does communicate, uh, it can organize, it can uh, enhance or hide things even uh, in a more or less veiled way perhaps in fact i believe that uh, uh, the, the increasing presence of the industry and uh, and the different languages of the industry it influences a lot um, our perception and it also standardizes uh, taste and uh, expectations as well we actually don't even realize that but uh, now um, now more than ever we perceive colors in relation to the culture of mess what we call mass society so when we buy a certain food for instance uh, this food uh, should respect certain features right uh, which are totally culturally dictated uh, and this concept is called in, in more like technical ways uh, culinary naturalness uh. so i'll give you an example in italy um, a good mayonnaise uh, a good mayo should be always yellow okay chicken eggs uh, should be dark and meat, for instance, should always be red uh, to be a good meat. However, if you move to the States, uh, in the US, uh, when a person buys an egg uh, or some chicken, uh, for example, those should both be very light in color. Or a good mayonnaise, for example, is always white. I don't know if you ever noticed that uh, you can buy different types of food. Uh, um, uh, that, uh, <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, maybe I, let me let me move to another location. Perhaps the connection is going to be a bit better. If it isn't, uh, can you hear me better now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Maybe like this. Um. So. Uh, what I was saying is that uh, um, 
in, in nature, um, however, the nuances of, uh, of potential foods are, are less pronounced than those used by industrial societies. Um, while in the past, in the past one, so um, in um, uh, one will use a dye only, uh, let's say, to live up dishes for a party uh, in ways that are they were purposely festive and blatant almost. Uh, today, industrial colors are are used to make food looking um, more healthy and, um, and natural. And uh, uh, the cultural mass, mass society uh, has deep has influenced a lot our our perception of color and uh, and the meaning we we give to to those colors. Uh, an interesting thing is that. Uh, uh, in, in pre-industrial societies, however, um, it, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, in fact, color um, had a more kind of authentic meaning that was mostly connected with the, the composition of the color, how much labor, for example, was necessary to produce the color, or even for religious power, for example. So in the past, uh, uh, choosing the proper color for a dress was, uh, was extremely important. Uh, so the picture you see on the left here is the picture of Madame Bovary. Uh, it's, it's a famous novel from Flaubert, written in the um, like 250 years ago. And um, the way we see blue, the blue color now, is very different from how society used to see blue like 250 years ago. To make a good blue, for example, in the past, uh, you needed a, a specific stone called lapis lazuli. Which was a very difficult stone to excavate, uh, very time consuming to be produced, uh, and therefore also very, very expensive, uh, right? Uh, so blue, is, blue, the color blue was a uh, was the sign of a life that goes beyond normality, like beyond the ordinary, almost a holy life, uh, uh, a sign of gentle regality somehow. And in fact, if you look at how blue was used in 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 like artworks, uh, he used to cover the dress of the Madonna, for example, the dress of people that uh, claimed uh, an, a life that went beyond normal, right? Uh, it was very important. Like, um, on the other hand, people that exerted power, for example, uh, used to dress up in red, right? If you look at kings, uh, the, 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 the red uh, um, of, of, of the, um, um, how do you call it? The, um, uh, the cover of the of the kings, um, it was a sign of power, of dominancy. Um, the, but red was made using a certain mollusk, um, which was drained. Uh, it was actually fish between uh, in, in specific areas of the, of the Mediterranean, and it was drained for short um, for short time. It was broken alive in pieces, uh, dried in the sun, and then left to macerate for a long time with water and salt. Uh, it was a kind of violent. A cruel process. Okay, so it was connected with this idea of of, of uh, power, of dominancy. So in the past, each color was linked with specific uh, perceptions and emotions as well. Uh, now this is gone, as I said before, because of the of certain uh, historical uh, moments in, in that determine our alteration in perception of color. But it wasn't like that all the time. Um, uh, so. The first, um, well, not really the first, but one of the first that uh, believed that each color can convey specific emotions is uh, John Gitt. Uh, Great um, was the first, well, let's say almost the first to um, theorize that there are warm colors like the red, the yellow, uh, the orange, uh, that are more like lively colors. Uh, and there are cool colors like the green, the blue, the purple, which are more peaceful uh, uh, colors. As, as one of you guys was, uh, was saying before, white instead was connected more to the um, feeling of feeling and perception of silence, uh, something very quiet. Uh, um, Kandinsky, uh, also uh, Vasily Kandinsky, he, 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 he taught at the Bauhaus from, I think, 1920, something like that, 1922, until the Bauhaus closed in 1933. So he considered color to be a sort of a um, transcendent language, uh, a way of examining uh, uh, 
like the aesthetic of the laws of the universe, universal laws. So he created a kind of very singular color theory, um, which was based on something called synesthesy. It was a kind of synesthetic approach to color composition. So I don't know if any of you is, is familiar with synesthesia. Synesthesia is a, is a kind of phenomenon, a perceptual phenomenon in which um, uh, the stimulation of one uh, sensory or cognitive um, pathway leads to um, ex certain like automatic experiences uh, in a secondary sensory or cognitive pathway. So um, particular colors are associated uh, um, with uh, both musical tones and chords and also geometric shapes. So Kandinsky thought that uh, um, a color can be linked, is linked with uh, uh, a certain sound, a certain chord, and also a certain uh, uh, geometric uh, pattern. It was, it was really the first to, to think about color in that way. He used to say that color is the, is the keyboard, right? That the, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is a kind of piano with the many chords, and the artist uh, or the designer is the hand that by touching all these keys set like the soul vibrating uh, um, in a certain way. It was very poetic. Uh. Um, the theory of, of uh, Kandinsky describes not only color in relation to music, as I said, but also in relation to uh, the geometry of objects uh, and, um, and their impression uh, on, on whoever sees that, uh, that uh, geometry. So, um, the square, uh, like the, um, it, it kind of formulates um, two core sensory and shape distinctions that are, well, particularly between yellow and blue in terms of movement. Uh, so, for example, the, he used to say that the yellow moves toward the viewer out of the picture plane. Uh, okay. It also moves out of itself. Uh, so, a yellow area always seems to expand. Uh, um, yellow is also in a kind of energetic, uh, it's a kind of psychotic, uh, bright, like luminous colors. Uh, and therefore it deserves a shape like a triangle. That's, that this was a Kandinsky way of thinking. Um, the blue, however, it moves away from the viewer, kind of recedes, it goes back. It also moves within itself in kind of concentric way. Kandinsky used to think that it's a kind of dull color. And for this reason, uh, it deserved a shape, like a dull shape, like a circle, right? Red uh, um, remains static uh, in comparison with the yellow, like a, tri a yellow triangle or, or a circular blue. A red is a square that remains static in the front of the viewer. It provides strength, right? So if you want to um, uh, work on uh, um, perception, the perception of something solid, uh, um, immovable, uh, uh, according to Kandinsky, the, the theory is that he uses a red square. I'm not saying this is a universal law, but this is what Kandinsky thought. Um, it's kind of intermediary color and therefore it deserves kind of intermediary shape, a transitional shape, like a square. Um, there is this other concept, very important, uh, the concept of saturation. Uh, so uh, all bright and saturated, uh, and all bright and desaturated colors uh, are like perceived as friendly and professional uh, um, tones. Uh, all desaturated and dark colors are usually perceived more as serious professional colors, professional tones. Everything which is saturated, uh, um, on the other hand, expresses something uh, exciting and, and very dynamic. And until now we talk about color, okay, um, and, and emotions. Uh, the, the important thing is that, uh, um, in design, uh, in, in design practice, uh, there are um, many brands that use uh, colors to convey 
uh, specific kind of, of, of emotions uh, to alter the perception of, uh, of objects. Uh. And not only with colors, uh, uh, but as, you say, as we said in the, in the beginning, uh, also with the uh, combination of colors and forms uh, or like form factors. Uh. We could say, for example, that um, uh, the, the general outlook of, the, of, the, of Alessi, which is a design brand, a very famous design brand in Italy, um, it kind of illustrates a way of designing objects for emotional experiences, uh, I would say. So if you look at these, uh, at these objects, uh, you, you perceive, you, you have the feeling of, um, of playfulness, uh, a sensation of playfulness. Uh, and this is dictated by the, the form of the of the object, the color of the of the object. Uh, if you look at this item, for example, this is called merdolino, which is like a, a, in Italian, it's the Italian word to say excrement, uh, right? Uh, but it's funny because it's, it's the name of the product, uh, right? Uh, so merdolino, it shows us that um, color and shapes are very powerful instruments to convey specific uh, kind of emotions or even to alter the common understanding and, and the perception of an object. So why is that, in your opinion? Why do you think this object, for example, alter the perception of uh, um, a toilet brush? Any idea? You can talk if you want. So why do you think this object uh, is different uh, and changes your way of seeing uh, a toilet brush? I'd say you'd see it as not something disgusting anymore, but something natural as it looks like a plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Uh true it's something that uh, it almost looks like a, pl a plant like life raising uh, uh, from a pot right uh, in opposition to um, uh, what we do with this object that is a uh, bad uh, isn't it uh, so yeah. anything else uh, I think that uh, it changes because uh, with to with regular toilet plungers, they're they're more likely they're very simple and their colors are not very vibrant. So like they're usually they usually have a beige handle with a maroon and dark one. Here the because the, the liveliness that the plant brings as well as the light green of the plant, it makes mm -hmm. it look better and more. Uh, more uh, accustomed to the modern era of like how about how color vibrance is mm -hmm. definitely thank you very much that's totally true so you see like how uh through just changing uh the shape a tiny bit and adding specific colors to an object you can alter completely the way you perceive it uh, uh, the question is how are emotions communicated uh, like, of course, um, we have colors, forms, materials, uh, but it's important to know that uh, um, these colors and forms and materials, uh, um, we, we are not dealing with this specifically today. You will in the future, if you if you'll have the chance to come to our classes, uh, um, they can trigger a kind of visual response on us. So visual response is all about our first reaction when we see an object for, for the first time. So a visual response is related to appearance and to also the physical features of, uh, of an item, like the look, for example, the feel, the sound. So what matter is the balance of the color, the form, the texture, the weight of the object. Uh, in, so in other words, you can say that uh, the object uh, to, to create a kind of visual response, it must feel and look good. So the visual reaction is a kind of a gut reaction, something that you almost feel in your belly. Um, so according to Donald Norman, which was the first, the one who theorized this idea of the visual response, uh, um, this happens with, with any products we handle on a daily basis. Uh, so this is a, a one of my favorite teapot for example, it's called Nana Teapot. Uh, 
and uh, it was designed by Michael Graves uh, a long time ago. And uh, for me, uh, this teapot kind of triggered a visual response because uh, when I drink from it, uh, I enjoy the appearance of, of, of the tea, especially when it's filled with tea, of course. And uh, I enjoy the idea that I have to lit the candle from beneath the teapot. So in order to um, keep it warm, you, you can switch, switch on a, a candle underneath. And then I enjoy the experience, right? So I use the object to trigger an experience. So Don Norman argues that uh, some objects, uh, well, almost all objects can evoke strong and positive emotions like love and happiness even sometimes. So emotions are, um, they are communicated uh, through form when they concern pleasure and also through possible ways of using an object. Uh. So um, emotion uh, is about our way of, uh, well, uh, let's put it in a different way. Um, so pleasure comes from our way of evaluating, pleasure in using the object comes from our way of evaluating how well uh, an object uh, performs, does a given function, okay? Um, so it can also turn out our daily habits, uh, like the, the act of using teapot, for example, into kind of the light, into something very pleasurable. And this is also the example talking about teapots uh, of the uh, Ronnefeld tilting teapot. Uh, this is the kind of things, uh, the kind of object that you use to entertain your, your guest because it focuses on pleasuring and um, um, like the, 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 the user and uh, bringing attention to the use and to the usability of the object, uh, how you use it. Uh, Another teapot, uh, okay, another shape, as you see, another color, like a very violent on the face. So reflective design, it triggers the kind of more contemplative uh, kind of cognitive part of the brain. Uh, it's really all about the story, to make it short. Uh. So the question is, can I tell a story with a product, I'm, with a product that I'm using? Uh, and what values does the product bring about or what, what, what kind of values does the object attract? Um, so Norman uh, illustrates this concept with this uh, teapot that you see here. He calls this the impossible teapot uh, or like a teapot for masochists, right? Um, so he, suge he suggests that um, it isn't a particularly beautiful object uh, it is certainly not useful, but it tells a good story, right? And what's the story? Let's have a look. Jonathan, there's no sound. Oh, sorry. Hey, Christian, want some water? Hey, Don, yes, please. Sure. That's a fancy teapot. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't well, have I'd, much water in it. I'd like a little bit more than that. Well, yeah, why don't you fill it, and I want to explain this coffee pot. Sure. So, this is a joke. It's one of my favorite jokes. It's sometimes called the coffee pot for masochists. Uh, it was done originally by a French artist, and this is a copy made just for me, and I've used it on the cover of my books. I love it so much, and you know, it's, what's nice about it is obvious. You grab the handle, it's obvious that's the spout, but it's also obvious that it's the wrong way. It won't work. The conceptual model is clear, and it's clear that it's, well, that it's a joke. It's impossible on purpose. What's the matter? Um, what are you doing? Well, uh, it doesn't have a place to fill. Yeah, so, um, I'm not sure I recommend that. Okay, then the other choice is at the bottom, mm. which I'm going to try. Mm 
Good. Seems well, to work. So far, I... That's a funny way to use a teapot. Yeah, that doesn't seem to work. That's not the way I used it before. Hey. <laughs> Why doesn't the water drip out? Oh, look at that. So, how do you think it works? What's your conceptual model of the way it works? It's a mystery. Mm. It's supposed to be a mystery. It's called a puzzle pot. Uh, the Chinese invented it ago about 400 years ago, and this is a copy. And you're right, there's no obvious way to put the water in. Uh, you don't really want to put it in there, and you turn it upside down, and there's a hole, sure, but come on. You pour the water there, you turn it upside down, the water will flow out. So, yet if I do that, look, where does it, how does it work? You're not supposed to be able to figure it out. That's the whole point. That's why it's called a puzzle pot. So this was designed by a trickster. Mm. A good designer, and this is the challenge for design, will design things such that somebody can have an effective conceptual model and understand how it works. Or go out of the way so you don't have a model, if in fact that's the goal, you know, to fool you. And the only way a designer can communicate is through the objects that they design. And there is the challenge and what this lesson is about. Okay, so um, in, the, in the video they talk also about something a bit more complex called conceptual model. We have a lecture, well, we used to have a lecture um, about that uh, in, in, the, um, in the second year, uh, but eventually we'll see in the future what that means. Okay, so um, the important thing for you to know is that behavior and, uh, and emotional design, they can mediate or, or trigger many different kinds of emotions. Uh, it's very important, guys, this. Uh, um, from joy to frustration, from, from the form factor, the colors, uh, the materials, uh, the old instruments that we designers can use uh, to um, infuse, uh, to, to, to put into objects, uh, to trigger certain kind of emotional responses. Uh. Um, so emotions, as I say, they're triggered, they're triggered through stories and to create stories through objects, uh, we can work with archetypes. So what is an archetype? An archetype is, um, is kind of pervasive idea, a kind of image that uh, consolidates over time in our subconscious memory. So the object, uh, uh, in this case, uh, it's the, it's the Carlton bookcase from Ettore Sozza's, uh, um, who was part of this design group in Italy called Memphis. Um, uh, it kind of uh, resembled the idea of, of, of a totem. Um, and the totem is seen as an object which is full of rituals and knowledge. So Sotsas in this library, he used the archetype of a totem for creating the story of a library. Interesting, isn't it? Or and as I said, the reflective design triggers also the contemplative, the cognitive part of the brain. Like, can I tell a story with the product I'm using? Um, so these are also examples of uh, um, Achille Castiglioni, another, uh, another Italian designer who um, pioneered a school called Ready Made, where he used to Mm, grab objects from one context uh, and uh, add them uh, into a completely new context uh, to create alternative narratives uh, behind objects of daily use. Uh, so the, the picture on the on the left, uh, um, in the picture on the on the left, Castiglioni borrows the chair from a tractor. Uh, so agricultural a chair used in agricultural purposes, uh, and he brings that into the domestic environment, uh, creating a seat for the living room. Uh, and the chair on the right uh, um, is uh, a bike seat. Uh, that uh, the funny thing is that Castiglioni, was, who was also a teacher, used to go around the classroom with this seat uh, and sitting around the students uh, in a kind of very agile, uh, uh, 
funny way using this kind of object uh, uh, by the way so taking the, the bike seat uh, into the domestic environment uh, so at home for example he used to have this close to his uh, uh, telephone uh, to make phone calls for example and now we go we move more uh, into the assignment for today the, this little assignment uh, uh, what, what is the important thing uh, that um, uh, you should take home with you today after we talk about uh, design as emotions uh, the use of colors uh, of form uh, to um, alter the perception of objects to create new narratives with um, objects the important thing is that uh, designing objects uh, means learning to to see basically beyond uh, uh, the appearance um, to look at the functions of, the, of these objects with different, uh, with a kind of fresh eyes. Uh. Um, so what I ask you today is, uh, is to combine the use of different things, like objects, uh, but also animals, insects or plants, uh, as a way of reinventing new function. And this is an exercise that I borrowed from one of my favorite artists uh, called Bruno Munari. Bruno Munari for me was a genius. Uh, he was a very naive, very ingenious person. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, he was he became famous and more like seen after he died. Uh, but he was he, he was a genius, like a real genius. Uh. Um, so for the exercise of today, you have to use objects as um, uh, imaginary elements of a chain that creates one or or more events. And I give you an example about this. Uh, so Bruno Munari, he created this, uh, uh, there is a book called The Machines of Munari. It's a very old book, um, but I borrowed these images from there. And um, he created these systems uh, using objects, but also animals, uh, insects, uh, and so on, uh, to create absurd uh, or imaginary functionality. For example, this is a, a tail moving machine for lazy dogs. So. Uh, you can't see here because it's all written in Italian, uh, but for each of these numbers, uh, there is a, a sequence of actions. Uh, so all the, um, uh, it starts with number one, what you see here, okay? And the, the, um, the text says, um, uh, like, shoot the uh, device against the button. This is the button the the lead of the box will uh, suddenly open thanks to a hidden spring and the box contains various things 18 stones one empty bottle 11 lenses one gas counter and one pigeon full of uh, um one pigeon okay the pigeon flies away with his typical box, which is this. But in one leg, he's got attached a cord of black silk, which was uh, connected to um, the axis of the wheel, this wheel. The, the thread pulls the wheel, and this communicates a movement of coming, of going and coming to the meter for um, to the meter. Do you want? Then he says, "Do you want a licorice stick? Do you want an apple? Do you want a little liquor? A peeled plum? Nothing. Nothing really." Okay, then let's continue our story. So attached to, attached to this meter, there is a, an Eiffel Tower, a job of big patience. A ribbon, a blue ribbon, is then connected uh, to a stick to which the tail of the lazy dog uh, is fixed. And in this way, the machine agitates the tail of the dog. So as you see, 
it's a very it's a funny story it's an absurd story right uh, so but it's 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 so funny ingenious and absurd uh, that, uh, that the real purpose of this is to help you um thinking beyond appearance uh, to help you looking at functions in different ways this is another machine uh, a lizard engine uh, for tired turtles I'm not gonna read the stories now. <laughs> this is a mortifier for mosquitoes. Uh. So what are you gonna do today? So I would like you to practice with this idea of using objects uh, as mediators of new meaning. Uh, I put a list of objects here. There, are, there is a bike, there is a lamp, there is a, a candle, a fork a tap, um, she saw, and other objects. So I would like you to uh, select some of those objects uh, and create uh, yourself uh, one of those um, machines. So it will be like Munari designs, Munari's machines, but in this case, it will be a machine with your name. Like uh, I'm trying to see. It will be like a uh, Anias machine, Arushi machine, a Faf machine, Alice machine, uh, and so on. Each of you will design his own machines using a, um, sorry, I was supposed to go, I don't know why it's not working. Okay. So each of you will design his own machine. You can pick like three, four, five objects from this image. Uh, uh, and then start to look uh, at how this object could trigger certain kind of actions. Uh, you can also add uh, other objects to the list. Uh, so let's say you pick like four or five objects from here. You can add another three, four, five objects of your own imagination. Uh, just try to create a machine uh, with a sequence of actions. Uh, and as if you look at the, what Munari did here, uh, let's go back to the first that I described. Uh, you see that it's all connected, right? It's all connected in a kind of absurd way, but it's all connected. And there is a little number. So number action number one, action number two, number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and, and so on. Until um, the system finish, and it ends with the, um, the purpose of the machine agitating the tail. So what I would like you to do is, um, is to use a similar setup. Uh, you can use the objects we, um, you see here uh, and reorder them, uh, like take a part of them uh, and then like now connect the functions together and number them and create a little story behind it. Uh, it can be an absurd story, but then you can uh, read it to us, to the class. So we have about, let's say, half an hour time, like 20, half an hour, 35 minutes time to think about um, this kind of weird, uh, bizarre system uh, of elements that create new functions. Uh, um, so to draw them, you can draw them, uh, you can make a photocopy of this, uh, um, you can print them and uh, attach them to a sheet of paper, it's up to you. The important thing is the story. The important thing is to see, is for you, is for us, to see how you think beyond appearance, okay? So um, if it's clear for you, I will, um, uh, I will leave this image on, and then I will see you in about, uh, uh, in about, uh, let's say 40 minutes uh, at, uh, at 10.25. And then we have a chat together. You can read your story to the class. And, um, and hopefully you can have some good laugh also about your, uh, your stories. Let's see. Is it clear? Is it clear, guys? Jonathan, someone's asking in the chat, uh, what is the purpose of all this? Um, 
I and think like, I, what's what's the function that we are creating? The function they're creating is uh, is sub subjective, uh, you know, like uh, what is the function of this? Uh, it's a mortifier for mosquito. What is the function of this? It's an engine moved by lizard for tired turtles. What is the function of this? It's um, it's an agitator for for the tail of dog. So the important thing, uh, as I said, is for you to learn uh, to practice with the concept of seeing, uh, of looking beyond appearance. Uh, this is the purpose. Uh, and the in the exercise, you need to use these objects I've shown you before as the as, as the kind of elements uh, of, uh, of this system. So you have to re-articulate. Uh, so those are just examples, right? Uh, but you have to, you can, we can re-articulate those objects and create a new imaginary function. This is the purpose. Is it clear? Use your imagination, guys. If you come to study design, you need it a lot. So what I, what I would like to see is, um, is uh, how you think, how you see. Let me see if I can if I can uh, uh, see the chart. The chart is here. Okay. Okay. Are we ready to go? What you can do is that at uh, 9, 10, 25, uh, some of you, those who want to share their work, uh, can just uh, share the screen and, uh, and show, show the drawing. You can make a picture. Um, is it possible, this, uh, Razan, or is it better to uh, get the, the, the photos sent to my email address? So once everyone's done, they can either turn on their cameras to show um, yeah. if they've drawn it on paper. If they want to share screen, they can ask for permission and we'll give it to them. Okay, otherwise an option is also to that I open the images and they send it to my email address. Yeah, that works too. Okay. So please guys, let's do this. Send me at uh, in about half an hour, you send me the your work at this email address. I received only three, three works so far. Um, are you going to send it? We can start in the meantime, if you like. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again and uh, open uh, some, some of the works in order. So let's see. Okay, here we have uh, Okay, let's go with the uh, Arman work. So Arman, do you want to do you want to talk about what you've done here? Yeah. What is this? Okay, so um, I just said uh, first I wanted to solve or create a machine for a problem I have, which is waking up. So I just created something overly com complicated. Uh -huh. So. For you have a bucket that's attached to a pulley, which also, which lifts a scissor as it's being filled by the hose. And when the bucket touches the table, there's actually a peg holding the bow, the bow back. So when the bucket actually touches the table, it releases the peg, shooting the arrow, which is aimed at the rope just above the scissor, which cuts this line. And I can't draw birds, so I just said birds would be on that line or on the pole, between the pole. <laughs> 
of them flying into a net in which they'd be caught and that would fall down onto a seesaw which would launch a rock at an air horn and wake me up so what is the title of this uh, of this of this machine um wake up in all caps okay so it's in uh, it's <coughs> excuse me it's um very nice and uh, one suggestion um hey, can you tell me your name again please uh, um it's arman arman yes so arman it's important that you title your work uh, right uh, so by reading one sentence uh, um you can really grasp what this is all about uh, and then you can move to describe the little um, the little actions uh, objects uh, um in the in the in the in the project uh, um but very very interesting and and uh nicely put so i really see a logic sequence of uh, actions even a bit absurd but that's what that was really the purpose of the of the um, of the of the exercise so well done did you find any kind of complications of something difficult uh, um any particular task uh, that was hard to do or or difficult to think uh, uh can you can you talk about that maybe a little bit uh, yeah um i didn't actually send this in my first email but i replied to the conversation sending a draft because this is me drawing my thing the second time because the first time um i actually had no idea of how exactly i wanted to do anything so i was just doodling around on the page until i got an idea and then I just started building up on the idea as I went but I spent a good 5 minutes just sitting there thinking of what I wanted to do to begin with mm and what about the disposition like the the, the position of the of the elements on the sheet uh, was it difficult to understand where to where to place each element or did you find it easy um the element placing was um very important um because on the draft if you look closely you'll see I've erased lots of things um, because I was just uh, fooling around with the ele element position because I said, oh no, this has to be in this position, not this position. So I had to actually inverted everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then my uh, machine worked if I inverted the actual original layout. Good. So I think what's also good here is that you follow the instruction of numbering the actions. Right? So immediately when, uh, when we look at this, uh, Imagine if this was without numbers, uh, you wouldn't know where to start looking at, right? Uh, so but you put numbers, so we know that uh, it all starts from the top and then it goes back down and then up the scissors and so on. So it's, um, it's very logic and very easy to follow. Well done. Thank you. So let's move to the next then. I'm going to open... Uh, I think we have another, well, we have a few others. Let's save this, no, let's do also. Mm. And soda. Okay, so let's go to Mahima. Do you want to talk about this, Mahima? Hello, yes. Hi, what are we looking at? Uh, I named my work as Between the Waves and I basically wanted to celebrate nature and I wanted to spread awareness. Like, uh, we all know that all of us are using a lot of plastic and how our water bodies are filled with uh, different plastic objects. So I thought of using the plastic wires as uh, to represent water and um, the clips as uh, organisms that are being affected by this imbalance. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just placed a few objects that work as a weight system and how these objects can be found in water bodies, uh, which is affecting uh, marine life. So it was more towards spreading awareness. 
Okay, so what this, what does, so this is not a machine then, it's more a, yeah. repre a representation. Uh, yes. Okay, why did you decide to go this direction? Uh, when I was looking at the uh, pictures, I felt I could, um, I don't know, I just felt this would work. So I just started working. Okay. Like, I don't have any specific reason. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting here is that you, um, you kind of uh, decontextualized uh, some elements uh, uh, from the original uh, a context of use uh, and you reinterpret them as uh, um, different objects. Uh, so the wiring becomes C, uh, the other elements become uh, um, other uh, components of this kind of scenario. Um, yes. It's kind of important uh, yet, you know, when you, when you receive a brief uh, to kind of try to stick with the, um, um, the limitations of the brief. Uh, so like in this case, it was really about designing a machine uh, um for the system uh, uh, where action and where there was action and reaction uh, um like in the previous examples we've seen how you know from point one to point eight or nine i don't remember each object was doing something to another object uh, something weird bizarre but it was doing something here i see more like a way of uh, representing so kind of illustrating uh, um a context uh, but um for example, why um, a question will be, will be like why is the why is there a bike there and not um, you know a lizard or or an animal? So what um, is the, what is the purpose for collocating specific objects uh, there? Uh, like uh, the bicycle basically uh, is representing the weight system. So I just wanted to show that how. Um, how humans are not able to create a healthy balance. Like you can see the bicycle is also not uh, well balanced. Like it's more towards one side. Mm -hmm. So like how in universe also humans are uh, sometimes- Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. Sorry? I was asking why a bike and not like uh, a fridge or anything else. Just to say that um, every everything we do must have a meaning or a sense, right? Uh, um, because bicycle had two circles, so I could use that for two platforms, like how a weight system has two um, plates or something. So like you can place weights on that. Mm -hmm. So I thought I could use these uh, tires as uh, something that could carry the weight because it has to be on both sides. Okay. All right, thank you very much thank for you. sharing, uh, Mahima. Let's move to the next, uh, which is Arman. We've seen it. Uh, let's look at Sarah's work. Uh, can you tell us something about this, Sarah? Yeah, sure. So what I guess it's... What are we looking sorry? at? What are we looking at here? Um, I guess it's a wake-up machine and it's similar concept to Arman, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> So first, the alarm sounds. So I guess when an alarm sounds, you usually press snooze. So this machine actually works on waking you up by a water stream. So first, this starts with a marble on the alarm. So the alarm eventually vibrates. Then this marble moves off the slope and actually bounces off the lamp to turn it on. So actually that... Um, turns on light as well because that helps you to wake up as well. So that marble eventually bounces off, hits a pile of books that fall in dominoes and the last book has a string attached to it which has a matchstick. So once the book falls and is horizontal the matchstick starts to swing side to side and what actually lights up the matchstick is that um, striker if you see, number six. Yes. So then that actually lights up the candle as well. Again, light to wake up, um, which breaks the elastic band. So that snaps, which is actually holding that mini bicycle. <laughs> so that mini bicycle ends up falling backwards from the slope and 
hits over the bucket, which was collecting water overnight through that tap that you can see. Um, so that hits the bucket and the bucket eventually lets out all its water and the water slides down this little um, slide stream and it gets narrower and narrower eventually hitting the person um, by a drops because it's so narrow and eventually wakes him up. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is also <laughs> very nice to see, especially the mini bicycle, I have to say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one comment, uh, um, uh, Sarah is her name, right? Uh, yeah. So like, uh, if you look at uh, the, peak, the drawings that Munari did, uh, you see that often, uh, um, I remember, for example, the, the lizard engine uh, for like tired turtles. Uh, yeah. um, you, you see uh, that um, all these objects are put together in a single item. So it's like a turtle that has something on the shell and then that something is connected. So you could almost, you have the feeling that you could grab the turtle and with it, you're grabbing all the objects. Right. Like all the okay. series of objects. So like uh, uh, what we do when we design things uh, is we try to give like a sense of um, uh, homogeneity, a sense right. of um, completeness and aggregation to, to the different uh, facets that uh, an object is made out of. Uh, so here, uh, but this is something you know, not to worry about, but this is something to point at. Uh, as in the, in the previous uh, work, uh, sorry, the very first work we've seen, uh, I see that all the elements are like, uh, there is a logic consequence between items, uh, between um, the actions of each item, but those items are not connected. They are kind of separated. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you, 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 are, you are creating a system uh, but there is uh, not yet a kind of unity in there. So again, like uh, what we do um, when we study design is also trying to look at uh, um, uh, heterogeneity uh, from the perspective of, uh, uh, from, the, from a perspective that unifies things, uh, that um, um, connect things together in a way. But thank you very much for sharing this. It's really, it was really inspiring, uh, Sara. Thank, thank you. So let's look at, uh, let's move on. And maybe we have time for a couple of other uh, works, uh, I think. Okay, so what, see this is Zreyas work. Um, Zreyas, do you wanna do you wanna talk about what we what we see here? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. So first thing is that over here there's a there's a man on a bicycle. Uh, guys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just to stop you. I think there is somebody with the uh, with the mic on because I hear I hear some kind of background noise. Uh, okay, yeah, it's gone now. Please. So first thing is that there's a bicycle here and there's a man on it and he's pedaling the bicycle backwards there. And then secondly, there's a, a wire that's attached um, to, the, to the pulley that drives the gear backwards and forwards. Uh -huh. and that ends up pulling the lamp backwards. So the pressure on the lamp actually kept the uh, suppression on the lamp actually kept it um, closed, and then when it, and then when it opened, the, f the fork would go flying off, and then it would hit the um, it would hit the uh, tap over here, and it would go backwards, and then water would come flying down, and then that would dim out the candle. Mm hmm. So it's a can is Zreya's candle blowout machine. Yeah. A very simple system, a very simple linear system, right? It's all developed horizontally. Is there a reason why you choose to develop the, the, um, the system in a horizontal way, Sreya? I guess like what I was thinking when I was watching this was um, the, the film Home Alone. Uh-huh. 
and you know how and you know how the kid sets up little traps around to drive the burglars away um and it sort of and all of them had a connection to each other and they were all in parallel with each other so that's what i thought of when i was making this mm -hmm. that's why you know in when, in when i look at this drawing uh, i think it's interesting it's uh However, you didn't add the description. You know, you've seen in the previous drawings how easy it is uh, when you um, connect it to the numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, you have description of what's happening there. So whoever watches your work uh, is uh, immediately capable of understanding uh, what's, the, what's the story behind it. Uh, just as a, um, as a, as a note. Uh, but um, thank you for sharing it. Let's look at... Uh, okay, we have Ali's coffee mug cleaner. Ali. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so basically it's a, a cleaner using electricity and batteries and switch, as you can see here. So as soon as you turn or switch uh, the machine on, uh, the motor will start moving and the brush will just turn and your coffee mug will be clean. So the stains will no longer exist. Okay. Uh, just a second. Okay. So as an as a note, uh, um, I think this is a very small a very small system, uh, Ali. Yes. Uh, it's yeah. interesting, and, but it's smaller, uh, meaning that, uh, for example. Uh, there are things that could be uh, questioned. For example, how is the how is the mug uh, placed under the motor? For example, under the brush. Uh, how is the switcher switched on or off? Uh, how are the batteries replaced? Uh, just to say that when you when you design a system uh, uh, of action and reaction like this, uh, um, it might be interesting also to understand. Uh, how things are done, how things happen, what action trigger another reaction. So you did it at the minimum here, right? But you could expand this more. So who, yes. bring, who, who brings the mug under the motor? Who switches on the switch? Who replaces the battery? Or where are the batteries falling when you replace them? So all these kind of questions uh, that will allow you to expand this, uh, this um, um, machine into something a bit bigger um, and maybe even a bit more abs a bit more absurd so um, uh, is this uh, uh, a mug cleaner for uh, like lazy breakfast makers for example so yeah and if that's the case uh, how will this impact the the whole uh, design so just to say that uh, it's nicely drawn it could be expanded. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So let's look at uh, maybe we have time for another one. Let's see if you receive more emails. Yes. Uh, Sarah, we've seen. We have. Uh, Afaf Nurani. Excuse me. And then we also have, uh, huh, it's the same, okay. So we look at uh, last, the work of Afat, Afat. Wow, this is very full. Afaf, are you there? 
Yes, sir. Okay. What are we looking at here? Well, what was this machine? So this is a machine which uh, works for you to get water easily. <laughs> okay. Like, it's a, la a lazy way to get your water when you're tired. Yes. Okay. Please go on. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so in the first step, the, there's a cat which jumps on a cushion and the frog is on the cushion by mistake list. so when she jumps the frog bounces off and mm -hmm. it, and it lands on a switch and the switch is connected with some wires the wire is connected with some with the lamp and the, when the lamp uh, lights up the light is uh, um, the, uh, um, beside the lamp there is some fuel and fuel is burned uh, by, by the help of the light's energy. Mm -hmm. So when the fire is up, uh, beside the fire there is a candle which also lights up and uh, on the top of the candle there is a rope. The rope mm -hmm. gets burned by the, by the help of the fire and the rope is connected with the cycle the cycle is uh, so when the cycle gets uh, when the rope is uh, burned the cycle runs down and um, there's a switch there's also a, another switch behind the uh, cycle the switch gets on by the help of the cycle and the switch is connected with also some wires the wire is connected with the water tank and the water tank is connected with the water pipe, the water pipe is connected with the water tap. It is brilliant. I never seen like a, like a, um, a better way to get water when you're lazy. I love it. Thank you, sir. Uh, one question for you. Um, can you tell me your name again? My name is Afaf. Afaf. Okay, so Afaf, so what happens between point three and four? So we have like uh, the lamp, uh, which is close to some fuel. So what happens there? Is there like a short, is it an, a lamp that is badly wired? So it creates a kind of uh, like short circuit. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. that's the type of short circuit. Okay, so it's a kind of badly connected lamp. Yes, sir. Ah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, so this badly connected lamp uh, lit the benzene and the benzene lit the candle which burns the rope. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Afaf, Afif, Afaf. You're welcome, sir. Yes. It was a great example also. Also like very nicely distributed on the page, I would say. Like uh, you use colors uh, and it was clear that uh, the wires are um, are all colored, uh, all different wires. So very logic and very clever. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. Okay, guys. So it's time for us to wrap things up, to to say goodbye to each other, and um, let me thank you all for being here today. Um, this was a very simple exercise. Uh, you know, nothing very special, but uh, it's really like about um, uh, what, what I believe uh, um, is very important for us as designers, like learning to watch beyond appearance, uh, learning to look at objects uh, um, in other ways than we usually do. And this is fundamental. It is fundamental because uh, uh, it helps us uh, um, unconstraining uh, uh, objects from their functions uh, and um, looking at them from different perspective. Uh, we practice this, I practice this a lot, um, designers practice this a lot also. It's really about learning to look with different eyes. So if, um, as I hope you will, um, um, you will be interested in studying design in the future, this is something we will go through again, a bit more in depth, of course, and, um, and uh, uh, more thoroughly. But uh, this is part of what we, we do. So thank you, everybody, for uh, your presence and for sharing your, your thoughts, your ideas. It was, um, it was uh, 
I'm, I'm grateful and uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the workshop. So I don't know if um, Razan, uh, is there anything else you want to add? No, that's it. We just have an open house happening tomorrow and then next week will be our last workshop. So please make sure to join us. We'll be happy to see you all. And thank you for attending this workshop. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, so.